one more time. Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to today's California Elder and Disability Justice Coordinating Council or EDJCC meeting. Uh, I am Carol DeAndres and I am a member of the Master Plan for Aging team here at CDA. And today is June 20th, 2023, and we are meeting in this virtual space. So we thank you for joining us. American Sign Language is provided and you have closed captioning is available via the Zoom webinars. Um, let's move to the next slide, please. So you can see here, uh, these are the meeting uh, logistics. You can join by smartphone, tablet, or computer on the Zoom link, um, or we have an audio telephone number that you can join. Uh, live captioning is available. We have American Sign Language. And the recording, the slides, the transcripts, and the meeting materials, you can find those on the Cal HHS EDJCC webpage. Next slide. We will have public comment uh, later in the agenda. So thank you very much. Um, we Time will um, be reserved. You will have two minutes um, allocated to each public comment. Attendees joining by webinar um, may use the Zoom, um, you may use the Q&A function to ask the question, or um, you can select the raised hand icon and we will go ahead and announce your name and unmute your line. Uh, and attendees joining by phone uh, can press star nine on the dial pad to raise your hand. And we will announce the last four digits of your phone number and unmute your line. And of course, you may email your public comments at any time to our Engage email box, which is engage at aging.ca. Gov. Next slide. Um, before I turn this over to um, my um, colleague Rajana to um, go over the, the purpose and the agenda and other Im interesting information, I do want to ask um, and remind EDJCC committee members if they haven't already done so, please rename your dis name display. Right now, it's just a very generic name of EDJCC panelists. So if you could hover over your video, there's three dots, um, select the dots, and then select rename in the menu. So if we can, um, if you can take a, a minute to do that, so we know who's joined us today, we would appreciate that. So now I want to um, turn this over to Rajana. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Hi, everyone. My name is Ranjana Maharaj, and I am the um, Elder Justice Specialist here at CDA. I'll be going over um, a few of the slides. Let's start with the council purpose. Uh, the goal of the Elder and Disability Justice Coordinating Council is to increase coordination and develop recommendations to prevent and address the abuse and neglect, exploitation, and fraud perpetrated against older adults and adults with disabilities. Next slide, please. Equity guiding and principles. We recognize that the past, current interventions and services to prevent mistreatment have negative consequences for some victims, families, and communities as a result of systemic discrimination and biases. To counter these negative impacts and to ensure equity and inclusion moving forward, we are committed to letting the following principles guide all aspects of our work in planning, coordination, and program development. Next slide, please. We recognize that all adults deserve to live free from abuse, neglect, and exploitation. We acknowledge the exi existence of systemic racism, discrimination, and negative impacts. In order to combat these Im its impacts, we must center equity at all stages of our council's work. Centering around equity does not just mean creating equitable solutions for all older adults and adults with living with disabilities, but also recognizing that implicit bias exists within all of us. We are committed as a group to acknowledge and explore biases while doing the work of this council. We acknowledge that while other older adults and adults with disabilities have many overlapping interests, they are distinct communities and any policies that are observed or recommended by this council should examine the impacts to each community. We recognize the importance of hearing direct, 
directly from older adults and adults living with disabilities, their lived experiences should always be centered as we move forward with the work of this council. Next slide, please. In today's agenda, um, we do have a full agenda. Um, we have welcome opening remarks, followed by landscape analysis and introduction to case studies. We have th three case studies. Um, the first two, um, the first one is on financial abuse, the second on physical abuse, and then we go into a break, come back to a case study, case study three, which is self-neglect, followed by the California Elder Justice Coalition 2023 blueprint and work group updates, followed by public comments and closing and next steps. Next slide, please. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our director, Susan DeMorris, who is the EDJCC state co-chair, and Eric Dowdy, the Alzheimer's Associate, Association Elder Justice Stakeholder Co-Chair. Great. Thank you, Ranjana and Carol. Thanks for leading us off and welcome to everyone today. We have, I am very excited about this agenda and it um, didn't happen by accident. So I want to thank our three work group co our three work group chairs, Jim, Vivian, and Bertha, for the work that's been happening since our last meeting, and Eric, Eric Dowdy for leading us as our co-chair. I also want to especially thank all of the departments that are joining us. We have representatives today from the California Health and Human Services Agency, Department of Healthcare Services, Department of Rehabilitation. Department of Social Services, Office of Emergency Services, uh, the Judicial Council, and the Department of Justice, and I'm certain that others will be joining us. We also have the Commission on Aging here with us today, and did I mention social services? If I didn't, um, I'll say it again. Um, we're gathered in June. This is a, a, a big month um, for the work that we're doing and centered on today, World Elder Abuse Awareness Month and Day. And I had an incredible opportunity earlier in the month to be in Riverside County for their sixth annual convening. It, it's just incredible and gave me so much hope for what is ahead for this um, council because they had over 500 um, law enforcement, county officials at all levels of government, consumer groups, nonprofits um, gathered together for their sixth annual convening. And it's just incredible, you know, rereading the purpose of this council. Um, it's happening in Riverside County and I know it's happening elsewhere. And um, that gives me hope that it can also happen at the state level. So a shout out to anyone who's on from Riverside County. That was very inspiring to kick off World Elder Abuse Awareness Month there. We're also celebrating Pride Month, Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. And on the 22nd of this month, in two days, we'll commemorate the Olmstead decision. So I all of these pieces fit together. And um, you know, the more I, I see many faces from the Disability and Aging Community Living Advisory Committee. There's so much intersection in our work and so much overlap in the populations that we're trying to reach and support and improve services and coordination for. So thank you to everyone who's who's part of this journey. Um, the budget is, I believe the budget's final. I've been on vacation for two weeks, so I don't wanna misspeak, but um, there's encouraging news on the budget front. Um, in particular, I wanted to highlight the package, the older adult behavioral health package that's been approved, um, that was proposed by the governor and approved by the legislature is just incredible. Again, another intersection with the population that we're talking about today with um, isolation and behavioral health and mental health. And it's just incredible that we have focused resources after um, Many years without focused resources, I just really want to thank Secretary Galley and the governor and the legislature for approving the older adult behavioral health package and for extending the deadline on the um, home and community based services. Um, the HCBS initiatives that are scattered among many departments focused on workforce and other home and community based supports that help people live safely and independently at home. Um, and there were no cuts in this in this very tight, tight budget year. And I wanna thank everyone 
on the call for their advocacy to make that possible. Your advocacy that started last year through, through the January budget, through the May revise and, and straight up through um, June. So thank you all for your for being vocal and for your advocacy. And um, I think at this point, I just turn it over to Tanya, another member of the CDA team. And I wanna thank the CDA team in particular for putting together such a great agenda. I expect to learn a lot from all of you today. Tanya, turning it over to you. Great, thank you, Susan. And thank you, Rajana. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Great. So what I'm going to go ahead and cover is the landscape analysis and then taking us into the case studies. That's going to cover a lot of what we looked forward to discussing with everybody today. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background first. What we're looking at right now is accumulation of some incredible work that's been going on with the EDJCC, primarily pioneered with the leadership of Achilles Saran and Andrea Higgins, who have done an incredible job with the gap analysis and much of their recommendations and scenarios that they've analyzed and presented to the EDJCC um, since last year and throughout 2022 and, to, and earlier into this year. So normally we would have Achilles um, represent his work and of course, you know, provide much of the analysis because he is a leader um, in this area, primarily in adult protective services. However, he's playing a key role today in our case studies and providing input there. So I'm gonna just summarize um, some of his amazing work that he has provided us and then allow us to open into those case studies that we'll be discussing shortly. So what this looks like is the landscape analysis as we're referencing it today is a continuation of the work that was presented in 2022. That's a person-centered scenarios that were used to identify gaps. And these scenarios in particular are the, what you see bulleted here. These are reports of suspected financial abuse of a community dwelling. Um, sorry, let me just dwelling of four older adults, reports of suspected physical abuse of a person with a disability in the licensed care facilities, and then the report of possible self-neglect by community dwelling older adults. So based off of these three gaps that um, our EDJCC groups came together and acknowledged as really common scenarios uh, that inform what we experience down in our systems and with individuals as they navigate, you know, the support services that they need. Uh, this is what informed recommendations that were presented earlier in this year. And we'll go to the next slide. So what these recommendations um, were is beginning one with the rep one reporting hub. So this is looking at, you know, being able to review triage and route reports to appropriate um, all of all agencies, so very much along the lines of the no wrong door system. And then the second recommendation that was presented was enhancements to the following systems, which was an expanded multidisciplinary team, collaborating across agencies, an interagency collaboration, um, enhanced existing peace officer standards and trainings, uh, working with courts, conservatorships, probate, increased funding for APS and public guardians and protective orders. And then the third recommendation to focus in on was timely crisis intervention. So to exp um, exp uh, I can't say it, protect endangered adults from abuse, neglect and self-neglect and timely interventions and protecting real and personal properties. So these recommendations um, and, and the presentation that can be referred to on the EDJCC website with the, the last presentation that was done in the last meeting. However, what we're gonna go into next is actually going to be us doing a case um, with a, a case study analysis in which we look for the opportunities to take those scenarios and analyze real specific facts that we regularly see in the public with individuals in our communities and look at how does that interact with our systems? How does that interact with the services that we provide and what 
Rajana especially, and through the, the great representatives of AGGCC has been able to do is bring together a reactor panel of these professionals, and we will be able to hear from them directly today on what it is that they would look at in each of these cases, how they would associate their services, how they would want to bring together all the resources in their communities and discuss where there's great opportunities, where there's they've seen successes, and also where they've seen opportunities to improve, where we can look at some uh, um, of those recommendations that I just highlighted, and we need to consider opportunities for, for further um, consideration in these, in these discussions. So case studies such as this, just to um, highlight you know, the importance of these kind of discussions with stakeholders, they demonstrate different areas of state service to work together to support older adults and disabled adults. They highlight key problem areas and how to execute solutions. They allow for us to discuss opportunities for additional research opportunities and explore new ideas, theories, and innovations. So that's what we really look forward to today is being able to really key into a lot of that collectively and represent those discussions here um, and have that opportunity for us to hear one another. And if we have opportunity then to continue that conversation in our subcommittee efforts and other such forums, we definitely want to encourage that. Um, but we're going to start today with the following case studies, which are fictional, by the way, but reflect common scenarios facing California, as it mentioned. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it back to Rajana, who will introduce our reactor panel and um, read each case studies before we open up for discussion. Thank you, Tanya. I'll go ahead and read the case study first and then introduce the reactor panel. The first case study is Hector Gomez's case. He is a 79 year old man monolingual speaker, speaks Spanish, newly diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and has a mild stage. He recently fell and broke his hip, had surgery, and is now in a skilled nursing facility that does not have translation services. The family is worried about Hector living at home, and they want him to move into an assisted living facility after he's discharged. The daughter has power of attorney and is asking Hector's doctor to provide an incapacity letter to activate the power of attorney that Hector signed a few years ago. Hector wants to return home and to receive services to help him recover from, his, from the broken hip. Um, Hector wants his longtime partner, who is 10 years older than him, to help with securing services, to help with managing his finances. Um, Hector also has a large amount of assets, and the daughter has been making large withdrawals from Hector's accounts. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our reactor panel. Um, our reactor panel has Achilles Saron, Bertha Hayden, Jim Trajari, Lisa Narenberg, Scott Perello, and Vivian Mabaku. And the first question I'd like to ask the reactor panel is, what are the key aspects that you see as being critical for addressing Hector's case? Um, I, if I, good afternoon. My name is Berta. Let me go. Um, one thing that immediately jumps out is Hector's language needs and, cult and cultural needs to just be sent in terms of making sure that as we're looking to connect him with services, that um, they meet his his comprehension needs. Also, in terms of looking at where he just received his diagnosis, um, looking to make a plan that is current that will serve Hector now as he's do, um, newly diagnosed and not making an assumption in terms of his decision-making capacity that is that is locking him out in terms of as the doctor as the daughter is suggesting um, pushing him pushing the doctor to um, have the incapacity letter um, as as a legal services attorney or working with our you know elder law team if Hector was coming to look at us I think um, putting his Physical needs now um, would be center. So looking at how we could get him the services to get him back in his home and then concurrently doing his planning in terms of what that power of attorney that he might have wanted at one time for his daughter to serve, how he might not want her to serve anymore and what we could do to switch who could be his supporter and then open up to see if he wants to continue with, wants to revoke it, do a new power of attorney, um, and look, start with that. Thank you, Bartha. 
Anyone else, Scott, do you, would you like to provide anything um, in regards to what Bertha just mentioned? Go ahead, Vivian. I'll let Thanks, Vivian. Um, yeah, so from the legal services perspective, I think the things that really jumped out to me um, were the issues of um, Hector being in a skilled nursing facility and the family saying they want to put him in a nursing facility after discharge. Um, but it seems like that's not really what his wishes are and he wants to stay with his partner at home. Um, and then also this issue of the power of attorney and um, it's kind of unclear whether the daughter is using that to make withdrawals. It's completely unclear if the power of attorney is valid at all. So um, I think really from the legal services perspective, one of the first things that we'd be really addressing is sitting down with Hector with a translator um, away from his family, um, just him on his own, and to talk to him about what his actual wishes are. Um, it's always good to point out that even if someone has an, you know, a dementia related disease, that does not mean that they are unable to contract with an attorney. Um, your ability to contract with an attorney really is dependent on your ability to understand that you have a legal problem and that you need help. Um, so if Hector was able to understand that a legal services attorney could assist him in figuring out what his actual wishes are um, and then either use their legal skills to do that or connect to other advocates that can help him figure out what he wants to do moving forward. Thank you, Vivian. Lisa? Yeah, um, I see these cases, I'm coming from a little different uh, background. I'm not a direct service provider. I, I come at it from the perspective of a, of a systems advocate. Um, so that's a little bit different. Um, I, I actually want to thank you for bringing up the issue of translation services, because I think that's one that doesn't get addressed a lot. Um, you know, clearly this is a situation where you really need unbiased, objective translators, because you've got somebody um, who's making, in a position to be making really consequential decisions about their lives, and you've got family members who are in disagreement. So how all of that information gets interpreted uh, to Hector is really important. I had the um, fortune of working at City College of San Francisco, which had a really great uh, tran medical translator program. And we did some work with their advocates um, around elder abuse and neglect. And it was really interesting because usually they're supposed to just translate word for word. They're supposed to be kind of a mouthpiece for for clients, um, but in some situations where they suspect abuse or undue influence, they really need to step out of that, which is um, you know, a, a tricky thing to do, but really this case demonstrates the need for that kind of, um, of um, unbiased translation. Um, as somebody that's worked on multidisciplinary teams for many years, I know our team would just be all over this asking lots and lots of questions. There are lots of, a um, lot of, we, we don't have a lot of information about this case. You know, so clearly they'd be asking questions about what kind of a power of attorney it is. Is it, is it for finances and healthcare? Uh, the question that Bertha already raised, you know, does the, does Hector want to keep the, the power of attorney in, in place? It sounds like he may want to transfer that. Um, I also have concerns about the authority, uh, the incredible authority that doctors have in cases like this. Um, and, you know, as was mentioned before, determining capacity is not a medical issue, it's a legal issue. Um, and it's a complicated one because it really gets down to what somebody understands at a certain point of time about a certain decision. And I worry about whether or not we have um, prepared doctors to make those kinds of decisions. This is a question that also comes up in conservatorship cases. You know, are they getting the training that they need to make these decisions? Are there others that could be involved in the decisions? So I think um, these are all policy issues. Thank you, Lisa. That's wonderful to point out. Um, we can definitely take those that policy issue back. Um, and then we will um, uh, 
you know, speak to the work groups on where we can um, include that um, in our, to further our work. Um, I know Blanca had had a feedback um, to provide as well. Blanca, did you want to speak to that? You're on mute. Yeah, just turning my mute off. Uh, thank you, Ranjana. This is an excellent scenario and one that we see all too frequently uh, with the long-term care ombudsman program. So um, I just uh, suggested to Ranjana that, and I think uh, Vivian, you already mentioned, there needs to be a private uh, confidential conversation with Hector. He still is the resident. He still has rights to make uh, his decisions. We don't you know whether he has dementia, but we want to be able to have a private conversation with him. And we, you know, we've had situations where um, we can refer him for legal because we are not the the legal experts that would be able to maybe um, report a potential financial abuse case. Um, unfortunately, we do see cases where family members are the ones that are the perpetrators, and we would definitely want to. Um, bring in a specialist uh, to help Hector. Uh, maybe he might even have to uh, re-assign uh, a uh, power of attorney to someone else so that, or a conservator so that he can, um, he's safe from that. Uh, but ultimately we wanna work with him um, to empower him. And uh, even in this case, his partner to help uh, make the decision that will honor Hector's wishes. Thank you, Blanca. It's so important to empower um, Hector. And I feel that his decision should be, you know, he he has mild stage. So I feel like he is able to still make those decisions for himself. So it's really important. Thank you. And I know we do have a few, um, few people with their hands up. Um, Howard, would you like to provide uh, a comment? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. My big question is who is standing up for her doing this? I mean, this man is in a dangerous situation. I mean, his daughter had power of attorney and she wants to put him away in a nursing home. And she is actually asking a doctor to write a letter, which would probably have a lot of weight with a court. And his family doesn't like the idea of him being at home. And it seemed to me that nobody acting what he wants or if anything can be done to help him live at home safely. And he mentioned a partner, I would like to know what kind of um, quality the, um, what kind of quality the partner has. Is the partner able to help him? Is the partner really able to help him? And are there any advocates out there that could be assigned to his case to, you know, Speak, help him speak for himself, be an ally. It sounds like this guy really needs an ally to go to back for him. Or uh, he's likely to end up in a nursing home and maybe all it may be taken for him by a daughter and family, which would not be a good thing. So it sounds to me like this guy really needs an ally. He really needs somebody to go to back for him. And uh, one of the things I would want to know is if partner really able to help him all that much. We don't know anything about the partner. Thank you, Howard. Those are some great points. Um, reactor panel, does anyone want to answer to Howard's point? Vivian? Um, I'd like to jump in and just uh, acknowledge that I think Howard's uh, point brings up the importance of collaboration across different aging professionals because his comment that it doesn't seem like there's really an advocate for Hector is true and just think for me just thinking briefly um i don't know exactly who would refer hector to legal services in this situation um if they didn't know that legal services was available or that there are clearly some potential legal issues um, but they're really unclear um, and that would be really important for someone to refer him um, but if there's no referral you know, so a, a doctor might take the power of attorney and just think, 
looks valid. Here's a letter. She's asking me for a letter and we have no idea whether this document was um, you know, produced in a way that's legal, if it's still valid. Um, we don't even know when it was created, if Hector even was a part of the creation. We have no idea. Um, so I think that Howard's point really illuminates how we like what we're doing right now, we need to have this crossover among all pro aging professionals, all elder justice professionals to understand each other's work so that we can make proper referrals to better protect people. Thank you, Vivian. I do agree. We do need to link, you know, bridge those gaps and work together to help Hector in, the, in this very complex case. And I know Bertha has her hand up. Bertha? Um, yes, just building on Vivian's comments, um, I think locally we've seen in Los Angeles that when we do get Hector's case as a legal services, where it's coming from is through our partnerships with um, APS and with um, the local MDTs. And that has been very transformative to our work. And I think a continued play up continued area for, for growth um, and expansion, because when we went our strongest, um, some, we would say some of as a legal services, you want to be positioned to, to help those most in need and our frontline responders such as APS or the ombudsman that make that referral to the legal services or that warm handoff are best positioned to make that quick connection. And over the over the years of, um, of having that local MDTs and focusing on strengthening our collaborations with AP, our local APS, we've seen being able to jump in into Hector's case versus when those relationships weren't there as strong. Thank you, Bertha. I think, um, Lisa, I, I do see your hand up. I know Marty's been, um, he has his uh, hand raised as well. Marty, did you want to provide a comment? Yeah, I would. First, uh, Marty Emoto, a family member, I'm a parent of a 31-year-old with Down syndrome and autism spectrum disorders, adopted um, because his mother had passed away and there's no family, and also a sibling of an older sister. She was in her in her 50s when she died with developmental disabilities. Uh, so I and CD can California Disability uh, Community Action Network. First, I, I want to thank uh, Susan and, and the CDA team, the California Department of Aging team, for putting these uh, case studies together. I think it's, I think it can be very helpful when you give specific examples. Um, and I, I like the reactor panel, so I just want to, you know, do a shout out there. I do want to make a suggestion, and and I don't know what the rest of the other case studies will end up talking about, but I, I would really urge that the reactor panels, and I think, by the way, the reactor panels are fantastic, but I think if you would also consider including the person, you know, who might be, uh, you know, a person or and family member too, who are, you know, um, subjected to abuse or financial abuse or any, you know, any one of these case studies, because as a family member, I've been on both sides of the issue, you know, and also as a provider. So, you know, Her um, Howard just mentioned about who is advocating for Hector. My question is, where is that information that that is in this case study coming from? Is it Hector saying that? Is this Hector's voice or is it someone in the hospital? I'm, I want to give you an example. I, Lisa Brown, who is the mother who has passed away of my son, Alex. Uh, she was in her 60s when she passed away, but she could no longer speak and no longer trusted her own decision-making. So she asked me to stand in and make the decisions for her because she didn't trust the doctors. And this is in Fresno. And the doctors were really great. Doctors wanted me because they couldn't communicate with Lisa. The problem though, is the doctors were really press pressuring the patient, in this case, Lisa, and me to put her on hospice care, to put her in comfort care and basically end her life because they just looked at her vitals. I vowed that as long as Lisa could make a decision, yes or no, I would follow her instructions. The problem though is the doctors and the nurses never phrased the question in a yes or no in a way she could answer. In my old, old, own sister, several times there was doctors or providers who might have suggested to end her life, don't do procedure. <clears throat> and if you, if they would have talked to her, they wouldn't have phrased a question in which she could answer it. And that's where 
I would come in. I mean, we talk about accessibility of language. It's also the way you speak to an individual. If they can't speak, you can phrase things in a yes or no and, and preserve decision making. So I would really look at these case studies. So having the person with lived experience, whether they're the person, Hector, or someone like Hector, and then the family member on the reactor panel as well. You need people with lived experience as well. And number two, it might be helpful in future is to determine who is, where is this information coming from in the case study? Who's the voice? Because Howard was raising that. If that's, if that's Hector's voice, that's, that's much more important than if it's coming from a nurse or a doctor, which is not to you know put them down, but we got to know who is giving this information because I know with my own son, with my sister and, and his mother, if you would have just talked to another professional person, the storyline would be very, very different. And that's not to suggest there's any evil involved, but the idea is we need to get the best information. And sometimes it's not always, it's a mixture, right? Of And we have to work in partnership. And also, by the way, I'm a family member, so I want people to be very, very careful when they automatically assume that the case study is assuming that the sister is stealing money. You don't, I mean, again, we don't know that any more than we would say that the doctors are mistreating or the nursing home is mistreating Hector, right? Because it depends on the viewpoint. If you interviewed the sister, her viewpoint is, you know, they're shutting me out. They're not listening to me, blah, blah, blah. And I think one of the values of this coordinating council is to get it right as closely as we can. And that's why I applaud you, Susan, with your team, because I think you're trying to do that. And, uh, and also in the future case studies, again, I don't know what the other two, if we can also kind of have, have case studies a person with developmental disabilities or people with intellectual disabilities as well, because that raises other issues. And I'm looking at Tony Anderson because Tony and I usually talk about these issues. Again, I'm gonna thank the reactor team. I think you guys are tremendous and Susan and your team, outstanding. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. All right, thank you, Marty. And just just to, to highlight, you know, a few points. One, I just want to be clear that these are cases that are built on um, data and common case studies that you know are experienced by our caseworkers that we, you know, and legal service um, folks. We are not, you know, in a position to be able to bring on, you know, lived experiences just because of HIPAA and other. Um, legal, you know, situations that we just don't want, we, we wouldn't be able to do, especially since these are recorded, um, you know, meetings, but we appreciate your input. And we also appreciate that the, the reactor panel has highlighted that um, doing that level of investigation, doing that level of um, talking to Hector, confirming the, you know, and, and having those getting into the weeds to that effect is a critical aspect in the first step. Um, so, you know, that's certainly I think a lot of what's being discussed at this point. That being said, there's some really excellent questions in the chat that are being presented to the reactor panel. Um, but before we get to that, let's go ahead and, and turn over to Lisa. I know you have um, some great insight as well. Well, I don't know if I have great insight, but I have <laughs> a couple of things to add. Um, just going back to to uh, Howard's concerns about where you how you get to legal services, just wanted to mention that there's been a lot of interest lately in legal medical partnerships, and I think that I, that whole idea is really in response to that concern. How do you get people from, you know, a, a, a hospital or any kind of a um, you know, facility to legal services. And so I think that's a really important model. I know they're experimenting with it in San Francisco and some other places, um, really great model. Um, I also, you know, the idea of empowering clients and making sure that it's their voice. In this case, Hector's in charge. I mean, nothing has been signed yet. The power of attorney hasn't been activated. And our presumption is that he is in, in charge and can make decisions. And so the goal is to really help him do that. Um, this is a situation where maybe we could be looking at supported decision-making or um, 
or restorative justice approaches. I think sometimes our traditional systems kind of push people into taking adversarial stands or labeling one person um, as the perpetrator, maybe prematurely. I think you know that was an important concern that was brought up. I say that when I bring up um, supported decision making and restorative justice. I say that with a lot of caveats and hesitation because of their both. Um, approaches that we don't know very much about, but there, we're starting to see them emerge in policy. And so I think it's important that we think about them. But in this case, you know, it may be that, um, that Hector is able to make some decisions for himself and that, you know, certainly um, we don't know anything about his, his capacity at this point, but assuming that he's having some, dis, uh, some difficulties, you know, he very likely understands does know who he would choose to make decisions for him and where he wants to live. Uh, and that may independent be independent of being able to, to pull off the financial you know, maneuvers that need to happen to, to, for him to actualize those, those wishes. But certainly you can work from there. And the idea of restorative justice is rather than kind of letting everyone take sides and, and you know, dig in, that maybe there are opportunities if Hector wants to bring people together to really figure to find out what people's motives are and and those who care about him what they're willing to do how they can help uh, how they can help keep themselves and and others accountable so I think this is one that we may um, that may be a good test case but we certainly need to be doing more research and possibly pilot projects to start experimenting with those kinds of interventions. Thank you, Lisa. I'm so excited that you said that this is one of, you know, one case that that could be a great one for a test case. So thank you so much. Um, I also have some questions in the chat and I wanna pose that for the reactor panel before I answer more questions. Um, do we know if there is any required training for medical professionals? That was a question from Sarah Steenhausen. Sarah, did you wanna elaborate on that question? Sure, um, I have a couple questions. First is, yeah, about the whole issue of training and if there's any examples of other states that have you know, requirements, I, I thought that was a really interesting point about ensuring that the medical professional isn't making, um, you know, decisions about a person's capacity. Um, and then also whether, you know, I, it was, I appreciated the input that you provided Bertha about some of the best practices about collaboration at the local level across APS and MDTs. And just curious about, you know, you had noted that there had been some funding in the local area uh, for those sorts of initiatives. So any any details on those sorts of um, efforts, I think would be always helpful for us to see. Um, and then I just also think that, you know, something I really love the strand about, you know, thinking carefully about just because somebody has mild cognitive impairment doesn't mean they don't have the capacity to advocate for themselves. And really seeing this as part of the, the continuum of decision-making um, and, and looking at the potential for, supported uh, decision making. Um, I also see that Carol Sewell had some suggestions for stronger guidance from the state on the work of MDTs and the partners. Um, I think that more details and specifics about what that could look like could be helpful. So what an excellent um, discussion. And just finally, one note, uh, I really appreciated, Marty, your comment about the importance of thinking about language access, not just in terms of what language, the translator might be speaking or what what resources facilities have for translation, but also thinking about translation that works for the consumer and not directly translating in ways that don't resonate with that individual, even if it is in their language. So um, just a lot of really good uh, food for thought in this discussion. Thank you, Sarah. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I know Jason um, had a question and he had his hand up as well. Jason, are you still there? Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. I'm sorry, I having some technical difficulties, but I just wanted to thank um, the panel. I really appreciate uh, us going over these case studies. I think it's really important to look at these like real world examples and, and discuss how these agencies work together to resolve them. I, 
I guess I had sort of a comment that leads into a question. I heard a couple of people say, like, who is, um, who is, you know, the advocate for Hector in that situation? Well, if, if Hector is in long-term care, we have a statewide program to serve as his advocate. It's the long-term care ombudsman program. That person is an unbiased individual who can kind of mediate between the family and, and Hector and, and find out if Hector has capacity or at least refer him to, to legal services or people who could assist him further. And I, I think it, it, to me, like it highlights the need for us to coordinate between these agencies more. I think people have been talking about that in terms of multidisciplinary teams, which are handled very differently in different parts of the state. And so I did just want to learn like what, um, what efforts are going on on the statewide level to, to better coordinate multidisciplinary teams and, and what agencies are involved in those efforts and what is the timeline around that? Ron, you know, if I may, I, I don't want to speak out of uh, on behalf of CWDA, but if anyone from uh, Anester, <laughs> if you want to speak up, <laughs> you're the you're the lead on this, so we're just happy to be part of the planning. Thank you, Blanca. If you or Anester want to speak on 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 that question, absolutely, go ahead. I'll take it. And yes, yeah, so on. Uh... First of all, I want to thank you, Blanca, for the shout out. And I just want to clarify as well. So CWDA is partnering with the Child and Family Policy Institute of California, CFPIC, to help organize this uh, uh, convening in November, which is centered around MDT collaborations at the local level and how counties and local partners can best implement aspects of the master plan on aging in their communities. So we're... Uh, very happy to have the participation of Department of Aging, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman, and many other local folks, local partners, and uh, partners at the state to uh, assist us with the planning. So planning is underway. We are in the middle of getting things sorted out and straightened out for this meeting in, no in November, and more details to come. We just had a survey that went out to our members to get more, a uh, better understanding of what it is our county and partners will need and want to get out of this uh, convening. So more to come. And we're definitely focusing on trying to strengthen those collaborations between our MDTs. Thank you, Nestor. Blanca, did you want to add to that? No? OK. I also have a question from Lisa Coleman. And she believes that it would be valuable to hear from the Office of the Long-Term Care Patient Representative, um, as this is a newly created department and tasked with providing representatives for the LTC residents who need medical treatment, but lack the capacity to make health care decisions and have no legal sur surrogate representative. I love the idea of considering whether we could invite Su uh, Susan Rodriguez, who's heading up that office um, to come to, you know, either a work group meeting or, a, um, you know, one of our um, full committee meetings in the future. I think it's a great idea. It's a little bit of a different angle and, and probably not somebody that would be, um, you know, in this case story, but there certainly would be um, a space for, for that discussion. Absolutely. I agree. And, and thank you, Sarah. So lots to consider for future efforts, as, as mentioned, we'll, we'll be taking back. Um, we have about five minutes left of, left of this case study effort. And one of the questions I have for our legal services um, folks on the, on the reactor panel is with regards, again, to the financial aspects, um, definitely not assuming that there is financial abuse, but knowing that uh, as the, the case study indicates, he wants his long-term partner to help with managing his finances, but his daughter at this time is clearly, um, you know, controlling the finances, associating uh, large sums, pulling out of the account that's become made, made aware in this case. And um, since the power of attorney is not necessarily active at this time, they're still working through, through that. No, you can go away. Sorry, I got a five-year-old here with me right now. <laughs> um, and so I just want to see if there's any thoughts that how you would approach with that information, knowing that there may need to be an investigation to that effect. Um, I can jump in. I, in, I would say that, like you mentioned, 
um, you know, you, I would approach the power of attorney um, with the understanding that it's not clear if it's valid or not. So I would need to get a copy of it to even see what was going on with that. Um, but I think what would be the most important thing is having, um, like many have mentioned, this separate private conversation with Hector about what are his actual goals, what does he want, and then also the history of what's been going on, because it's not always just because she has been taking money. It seems, it let's assume the daughter has been taking money. It's not clear whether or not she had allowed him to take money in the past. Um, there had been some kind of understanding. She had been managing things. It's really up to the, you know, attorneys are client driven. So it's really determining whether or not the client, what they want, um, how they want to move forward. And even if there is some kind of um, exploitation going on, it's for attorneys, it's also up to the client whether or not they want to pursue some kind of action against a family member. Um, it's not really a situation where an attorney can just go rogue and do something or report something um, against their client's wishes. So uh, from specifically the legal services perspective, um, it's really client driven and it's really figuring out what Hector wants and how he wants to move forward, who he wants to help take care of him um, in the future and what he wants to do. And I would just jump in once again from the system's perspective. Um, you know, we need more accountability with powers of attorneys. And that's something that we talk about in our blueprint, which I'll be talking about later. But it's not, um, you know, we, we sometimes hear powers of attorney being suggested as an alternative to conservatorship. And in many cases, it prevents the need for conservatorship, but it also doesn't have nearly the protections. Um, and it's my understanding that courts can actually ask for accountings by agents of powers of attorneys, but it's not a system that's used very much. I think that's another one that needs to be looked at. Yeah, and if I may just building off on, on the from the legal perspectives conversation and something that very important that Lisa had mentioned in terms of now I think as legal services providers, um, our elder law unit, for example, has a social worker and uh, many of our um, one of our lead attorneys, Danny Kaiserman, I know is a big advocate of trying to get restorative justice principles as part of a service that we can offer, because it is a lot, if we assume, if we just for the sake of conversation and talking about different service models, let's assume that Victor is a victim of financial elder abuse. And how could we uh, make him whole? How could we protect him in the future? Um, a lot of times we do see, as, as, men, as Vivian mentioned, that family members don't want to go forward. And so they put themselves at risk um, for, the, for the sake of not hurting their loved ones. So restorative justice, um, we right now, you know, we look at those principles to see like, you know, should we have a family meeting? Is, is, the, is the agent willing to come? You know, do we send a, an informal letter saying like, hey, you're, you've been acting in a fiduciary capacity. Can you please provide us an accounting? Um, you know, try those less, heart, um, those less harsh family connection um, that could also pr protect uh, Victor. Um, and then of course, if um, I, I should note that it, it, I do believe it said that there was, it was a sizable estate. So if it was a sizable estate, actually legal services might refer to our private bar. And so I think, um, you know, it, I really appreciate oftentimes we don't talk about it from the perspective of, of lower income or individuals that need legal services, but our private bar also, um, you know, is there to support these individuals. They would probably financially not, if somebody was a very sizable estate um, as a legal services, sometimes we can, um, we can connect in order to stop the harm and then might refer them to the private bar who has um, better, is better equipped to handle any wealth management needs that Victor might have. Thank you, Bertha. Scott, did you, I know your head was up for a minute. Can I put you on the spot? You can, I just see times dwindling. So I would just offer that, you know, from a law enforcement perspective, resources, you know, is such a, a problem. And I don't, I don't think based on what we have here that you're gonna get a police agency necessarily to take on the investigation at this point. However, a way that you can get these investigations going is adult protective services in California can go to a financial institution and get the the uh, banking records because 
if you're looking at criminal financial elder abuse, you know, we want to see what the activity is on that account. And if even as a power of attorney, right, that uh, the daughter's acting as a fiduciary or, you know, if, if we, if she's spending the money at casinos, uh, which is very common in our cases, then that would obviously is a way to get the attention of law enforcement to launch a criminal um, elder abuse investigation. Thank you. That's really helpful. And you're and yes, we are at time for this case study. So Rajana, would you like to take us to the next one? Absolutely. Thank you. The second case study is for Hua Chan. She is, Hua is a 90-year-old woman, monolingual speaker. She speaks Cantonese, newly diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, moderate stage, at a skilled nursing facility. It's indicated that there are translation services. However, none are provided when Hua asks for translation assistance. Hua's daughter recently visited and is concerned with the bruising on her arms and thighs. Her daughter questions a certified nursing assistant, and they believe that there may have been an inappropriate sexual contact uh, by the registered nurse. Hua does not remember how she received those bruises, and Hua does not have a power of attorney on file and wants to go home with her daughter. On the reactor panel, we have Blanca Castro, uh, Bertha Hayden, um, Scott Perello, Vivian Mabaku, Achilles Saron. However, I don't think Achilles or Jim are on right now. But um, can we have our reactor panelists, um, if you have any comments? Um, the, the question is, again, what are the key aspects that you see as being critical for addressing Pua's case? So this is Blanca, State Long-Term Care Ombudsman, um, really important uh, case study in this situation. And so first of all, the um, fact that um, her daughter is bringing this uh, uh, to our attention, um, the ombudsman would immediately be um, involved in this. There's no power of attorney, but we would still need to get consent from the resident to um, investigate and we would have translation services that's required by skilled nursing facilities to have a contract with the translation services uh, if they don't have anybody in the uh, and we would um, certainly if they didn't have any we would be working directly with oftentimes triple a's will have um, translation services and we can uh, tap into those but um, we also have ombudsmen who speak on a variety of languages, particularly when they're in communities where there's a, a high percentage of residents who have a uh, certain language capable uh, needs. <clears throat> and then most importantly, because it is um, potentially a uh, physical abuse, we would uh, cross report to licensing and um, a surveyor would um, more than likely work with us on this. They would be doing their own investigation, uh, but we would, and if this individual is um, a Medi-Cal uh, or is receiving Medicaid, we would also cross to report to the Division on Medi-Cal Fraud and Elder Abuse with the Department of Justice. Um, so that brings in a law enforcement entity. Thank you, Blanca. Scott? Yeah, the, these cases are so concerning. Anytime we have an allegation of, of sexual abuse in a facility, the, the most um, concerning part in this scenario is that the daughter is reporting it because you have a facility full of mandated reporters. Um, so that's the most concerning thing. We want the case reported, but we want it reported in an appropriate way for, for those um, I have not introduced myself. I am a, a county prosecutor, a deputy district attorney. And there is an unfortunate gap here that we've stumbled into the hard way on a lot of these sexual abuse cases in facilities. And one is the multiple places that people can report. Now, we often have victims or family members who believe they have reported something. But for example, maybe they've Maybe it's been reported to the ombudsman and there's confidentiality issues. Maybe they've reported to the Department of Public Health. 
Um, it doesn't necessarily always mean that someone from law enforcement is investigating the case. And I have had cases with employees of facilities as the suspects and multiple victims. And the victims did think that they had reported it and it, it wasn't the case. So for uh, to the extent that uh, we can advocate from within the system that people in facilities should know that if there are any allegations of sexual abuse, that should be reported to their local police agency. That's really the best place to report these um, to, um, and not necessarily through the Department of Public Health even. So I, we've got to make sure that these cases are reported the right way. And uh, so often uh, what we've learned is that there's multiple investigations going on. People are talking. It, it kind of falls outside the norm of a traditional police investigation and it impacts the ability to hold these uh, people accountable. And that's how you get these horrible scenarios we hear about in the news where someone that had a history that no one knew about was still working in facilities. So um, that that is a, a huge issue that I've seen firsthand in um, in several cases. So that that's clearly an issue. As far as the bruising on her arms and thighs, that that is um, another obvious concern, and, and you, you know, there are um, investigative, um, I guess, skills, both from uh, skilled investigators and medical professionals to determine sometimes if these bruises are more likely uh, abuse or just bruising that occurs in the natural course of being cared for, of being helped lift, you know, lifted out of your chair, your bed, or those things. So, uh, we want skilled uh, investigators and medical professionals to document, photograph these injuries and, and to talk about whether or not they are suspicious or not. So that's just my kind of initial impressions. Thank you, Scott. Yes, those are, the bruises are very concerning and it would be, you know, very instrumental if there were um, skilled um Um, the ability to have someone that can really go in and make sure that it's documented and that is what's happening, the allegations, um, is very beneficial in Hua's case. And I want to go back to Blanca. Blanca, you do have your hand raised. I'm really glad. Uh, I just wanted to react to, uh, to respond to something Scott said. We would ops, we would report directly uh, if we saw something uh, that warrants um, something like this case to law enforcement. Here's the challenge today, Scott, and it's it's unfortunate, but oftentimes these cases are not a priority, and that's one of the reasons we try to get um, the involvement. And, and not necessarily with public health, but we'll go to the Department of Justice um, and try and get some somebody who has more of that law enforcement um, uh, behind them because they can do some investigations and can bring in law enforcement with them. So just wanted to bring that up because this is also very um, timely with and, and within the discussion, I think that's one of the gaps that we find currently happening. Blanca. And Vivian did also, she she brought up the fact um, that there is confusion about reporting in facilities of what's being addressed with Assembly Bill uh, 1417. Vivian, did you want to speak, um, speak to that? I'm no expert. If Jason is on the call, I think um, he might be able to speak on that. I'm not sure if he's still on the call. Jason? Um, Hi, yeah, I'm still here. Uh, this is Jason Sullivan Halpern from the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association. We introduced AB 1417 with Assembly Member Wood to simplify the mandated reporting requirement in long-term care, um, because while you're correct, I think people have mentioned it, there are individuals that are mandated reporters in these facilities that are expected to report. The process is extremely complicated in long-term care. It's not just a simple call to APS. You have to report to multiple different agencies and there's different timelines depending on 
the type of abuse. You have to figure out what type of abuse and then figure out how long you have to report it and where you need to report it. And we, we simply need to make it easier uh, for people to report. So that, that's one thing that AB 1417 is doing. And there, there are other bills being introduced this year that, that focus on um, elder abuse and, and dependent adult abuse. Um, but I also just wanted to add that um, a big part of that is education too, right? Because we can pass laws that um, change the system, but we, we need to make sure that people are aware of it. And I, I think there's a long way that we could go in terms of, of, of providing that training to, to all parties, you know, people in facilities and, and also um, people who work for MPTs or, or um, Adult Protective Services too. Thank you, Jason. And I think I, ha I see Lisa, Lisa Narenberg. Did yeah, I just, yeah, I just wanted to um, mention, and this goes back to Scott's um, issues about the difficulties of investigating in nursing homes. Um, we do now have at least one um, forensic center in the state that specifically is looking at nursing homes. I'm actually going to ask my colleague, Carol Sewell, if she has uh, uh, a contact for the team in the Los Angeles area. It's something that we thought we've talked about for many years, wouldn't it be great if we had a forensic center that specifically focused on nursing home abuse because there are such so many um, complexities in those cases. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Lisa. Bertha, I see your hand up. Yeah, I, th I think in terms of the facts um, presented, this is really a scenario in order to um, protect our elder that would be a multi-agency, you know, collaboration, whether um, from civic, criminal to legal services. And um, just looking at it from the, the narrow issue of like from legal services, if um, the older adult or or their daughter were coming to us and assuming that, we, you know, we are working with having a Cantonese translator during during our interview and speaking to the older adult and also making sure that across across teams individuals have I think, I think one thing that we've looked at is having a trauma um, informed training for staff and so that we're better equipped when we're dealing with clients that might be ha be recovering from these issues and talking about whether pursuing an elder abuse dependent adult restraining order against the potentially the worker would be some a temporary would be something that they would want in you know in the interim um, to, to protect her. And also the idea that she, she has capacity. She's not been adjudicated not to have capacity. She can leave the, you know, she can decide to go to a different facility. She can go home. And then from a legal services um, perspective, we were working with her, like, you know, looking to see like, okay, where, where do you want to live now? Do you want to live with your daughter? Do you want, you know, what housing options and looking to see if we need to work to support with a, a Medi-Cal IHSS application or if we need to or if it's more about looking for a different facility and what you know what facility what the facility would need there um, and then lastly I just when we come across these scenarios and people are in different places I always think you know the difficulty in the crash course that everybody has to do in navigating the different resources. I mean, you know, Blanca, um, when you covered everything, it just reminded me, we do have some really amazing and strong resources in California. And it's in, it's more about like, how do we quickly, or how do we um, elevate or shine those resources so that people can navigate them? You know, I, um, you know, what should be in every room or, you know, what, what more community education do we around do around that? So when somebody's checking in, they can have like an easy, you know, pyramid of like in case of this, call this, and just working to create more resources because you know, I do think in certain in certain in certain cases like the last scenario, it becomes about connection and making it easy to know like what is the right door, what is the right number to call for that immediate relief. Thank you, Bertha. Um, I do have also. Howard um, has his hand raised. Howard, did you have something to add to the to the case study? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I, there are three things that jump out at me. Number one, that nursing facility has translation services, but they have not been used in her case. Why are these translation services not being used to help her if they had them? That's number one. Number two, um, the question about those bruises on her, 
She says she doesn't remember. My question would be, does she not remember or is she afraid to speak out for fear of retaliation? And number three, why a BRM being a potential suspect? Um, does this resident know who they think might be well abusing her? Does she have a history of abuse? Has she been under investigation before? And are there any other people there at that nursing facility that might have been in a position to inflict the abuse on her? Those would be my question. And again, that points out the need for an advocate. In this case, that woman might have her daughter to help advocate for her, which would be good. But still, she could do with somebody who trained and able to, as you say, help her navigate the system. And it also shows a reason for interagency cooperation. You mentioned that, you know, multiple investigations. This RM might, be, have, might have been investigated by several different agencies who are not talking to each other. If they talk to each other, put it all together, there might be a very strong case against her if she is indeed the abuser. And that is my comment about it. Thank you, Howard. Those are wonderful perspective. Does anyone wanna provide feedback on Howard's uh, comment about retaliation and how the investigation would go on to see if there are other uh, forms of abuse in this facility? Blanca? Sure. Uh, <laughs> so first of all, retaliation is probably one of the biggest fears that um, all residents have, and it's whether it's um, visibly that they um, express retaliation. So um, keeping this individual safe, and that may need, that may be that um, as soon as you report to law enforcement and bring them in, um, it may need that we, it may be that we take the individual or have the individual um, examined by a medical professional and remove them from the facility. Um, so while the investigation is going on and then maybe even try to work with family to find them a place that they can feel safe. Um, so I think first and foremost is, is the safety of the of the resident. Thank you. Thank you, Blanca. Uh, we have a hand raised by Jennifer Euler. Jennifer, would you like to add a comment? Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm from Department of Justice Division of Medical Fraud and Elder Abuse. Scott touched on it earlier about the mandated reporting duty. Um, there's a reason that it's in statute and that's and that it's a misdemeanor. And that is because if one resident may potentially be being sexually abused or violated by an employee, that that does not mean it's limited to the one resident. And so I think stressing the fact that mandated reporting um, is an actual legal duty and has criminal consequences if you violate it uh, and getting that that education, that knowledge out, I think that's critically important. Thank you, Jennifer. And I also see Kimberly, Kimberly Kirschmeyer. Yeah, I just wanted to also jump in here kind of also to what Scott was saying. And because the individual was a nurse, a registered nurse that have these allegations, want to make sure that also the Board of Registered Nursing would also be included in this. Um, and whether it's from working with law enforcement, um, the Board of Registered Nursing actually has their own um, division of investigation that are sworn peace officers that can also investigate, um, but they would need to be working together either with local law enforcement if they're also looking into it. So it's, again, that partnership of everyone working together, but it's important to point out that the Board of Registered Nursing is the only one that can take action against the individual's license. Um, if there were allegations that were proven, so they wouldn't be able to then move on to another facility or even on to, you know, potentially another state to continue that abuse. So it's important to remember that those boards that license the individuals um, also are involved in this um, investigation. So I just wanted to bring that up as well. Thank you so much. And I do also have a comment from Jason. How often is failure to report prosecuted also for mandated reporters. How often is failure to report prosecuted for mandated reporters? So I can answer that, at least from the Department of Justice standpoint. We do it quite regularly. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know about local law enforcement. It is just, you know, I say just a misdemeanor, but um, at the Department of Justice, anytime we prosecute somebody, a caretaker, um, anybody like that, we report them to the National Practitioners Database as well as to the Office of the Inspector General, which has them excluded from any Medicare or Medi-Cal programs. So if they are convicted, if they plea, if they get diversion, that all gets reported. And typically those individuals cannot are not employable um, by a, a, a facility that accepts Medi-Cal or, Medi or Medicare funding for the period of about five years. So we do prosecute it quite often. Um, and there is a big hammer in collateral consequences despite it just being a misdemeanor. Thank you, Jennifer. Can I also add um, how how often is the data recorded for something like this? Do you have do you, do you have data that follows um, the prosecutions? How how is how is that collected? So we track it internally. I don't know if there is. Um, we don't report it to. We don't say we've done this many number of uh, mandated reporter prosecutions in the last year. We don't report that to anybody. We report all of our statistics to the Office of the Inspector General um, yearly, but we don't necessarily break it out by mandated reporter uh, prosecutions. Thank you. I also have an additional question to the reactor panel. Due to the suspected abuse, what steps can be taken to support who has emotional Emotional well-being. How can the facility address the psychological impacts of the alleged abuse on Hua? Can you read that question again? Absolutely. Due to the suspected abuse, what steps can be taken to support Hua's emotional well-being? How can the facility address address the psychological impact of the alleged abuse on Hua? That's an excellent. Excellent question. Uh, if I could take it, I think um, actually recently there was. Um, we, we know that um, we need uh, more behavioral health specialists to serve older, well, all ages. Uh, older adults, though, in particular, really need to have immediate access to um, somebody who can speak the language. Um, and we recently had a situation where we were. We um, connected immediately with um, Department of Justice at the local level, um, APS, and um, they had specialists that they were able to then connect the um, family member to um, for a very, diff you know, it was a very difficult case uh, that that uh, occurred that this individual was going to need uh, somebody to help them with the trauma, post-traumatic stress, all the things that go with um, sexual abuse. Thank you, Blanca. I think it's really important to have those, those services for someone in a situation. Um, so thank you, we really do appreciate that. Does anyone else have any questions or any feedback from the reactor panel? Uh, no. Raj, Lisa has her um, hand up. Oh, thank you so much, Carol. Go ahead, Lisa. I apologize. That's all right. I was just going to add that, you know, one of the um, agencies that's represented on the council is the uh, California Office of Emergency Services that does a lot of victim services. And, you know, I think something that we've talked to some of our colleagues at the organization about um, and I don't know if the person on the call today might want to respond to it, is, you know, the need to get victim advocates into nursing homes and facilities. Um, it's not a place that um, I think there's been a lot of work done, and victim advocates can refer people for, you know, different kinds of counselings, but I think we that's a, that's a bridge that needs to be strengthened. I agree, Lisa. Thank you for bringing that up. I think it's very important. We can also take back that same question and pose it to our work group. Thank you. Hi, Jim, welcome. Hi, all. I'm so sorry. Somehow this was not on my calendar at all. It, it was, so I apologize for, for being very late, I think. <laughs> it's okay, no worries. Would you like to add to this case study? 
Uh, I will probably jump in on the night. I didn't hear this one. Uh, I jumped in kind of mid commentary. I, I hear the through thread of collaboration and, and I am encouraged to hear that because I think that's a lot of um, a lot of the answers we're going to be coming up with is really that cross cross uh, referring intersectionality, uh, what Lisa brought up in terms of bringing just kind of more folks to the table who have resources uh, and understanding the role each of us is playing. Thank you, Jim. With that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, can you please move the slide to a break? We do have a 10 minute break. Um, if everyone would like to come back at 2.31, we can take a quick break and then come back. Thank you, everyone. Hello there. Welcome back. Uh, it is 2.31. We are having a, a really dynamic conversation. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Rajana for our um, case study number three. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Before we get into case study number three, I would like to have Tanya go ahead and um, if she would like to speak on the, the last case study, case study two that we just spoke about. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to acknowledge um, that, as Carol mentioned, this has been a very robust study of very complex case studies with a lot of information for all of us to, you know, conceptualize in this moment and really react to. So we appreciate everyone taking the time to have informed conversations and really look at our roles and responsibilities um, to individuals who be having these experiences. So that being said, you know, we just want to do a real quick recap of these discussions, looking first at case study with Hector Gomez. And um, Sarah, I, I think you have the notes for that one first. Sure, absolutely. I just want to thank you so much. And I really appreciate um, this just excellent conversation. And Jim, um, apologize that we didn't get the meeting invite out to you, but we'll be sure to have you be able to listen in on the discussion from the first case, first two case studies. Um, the main themes that I recorded in that conversation about um, Hector is really thinking about the collaboration across MDT and APS and how we might strengthen it. And it was also noted that this is going to be the focus of a convening this fall that uh, CWDA is pulling together. So we really appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to elevate these issues there. Um, also really important themes raised about language access and access to interpreters, but also importantly, thinking also about how words are translated for consumers and making it so it's uh, easy to understand. And uh, the more that we're able to develop approaches that work for consumers, the more that they're able to have their voices truly heard. Another issue that was elevated is the importance of training for the medical community and what kind of examples are there of that um, and how we might ensure that doctors are not um, put in the position of informally suggesting that a person is lacking capacity when that's really not their place to do so. Um, and that just kind of goes into the other theme of the importance of the consumer speaking on their own behalf. Um, unless there is obviously a different situation like a conservatorship, really, really, really needing to prioritize the voice of the consumer um, and exploring potentials uh, in you know, the circumstances where it's warranted, thinking about supported decision-making as a tool in those sorts of instances. Um, also the importance in these discussions in general that was elevated of hearing from people with lived experience. And uh, I think it was noted that we need to be very careful about privacy issues, but we might wanna consider um, the role of consumers on this committee and the extent to which consumers as advocates can speak about their own experience and add um, substance to the discussion. And then also uh, finally what I heard was the importance of looking at uh, powers of attorney and ensuring that there are uh, safeguards on abuses in power of attorney situations. So those were some of the themes I added. I, I tracked and I think give a lot of 
substance for future conversations in the work groups. And I'll hand it back over to you, Tanya. Great, thank you, Sarah. So I will just do the recap for um, the second case study in which this was for the nine-year-old woman. Um, and in this case, there was a lot of common themes as the first case. So highlighting some of what Sarah already discussed with you know, bringing in the language services, really making sure that there's that level of multi-agency collaboration. Um, in this particular case, what really brought out um, some of the more urgent aspects of bringing in the Department of Justice, looking at the mandated reporting requirements, um, taking into consideration that if there's any level of suspected physical and or sexual abuse, there is triggers that need to be associated immediately with the, the facility staff and that ombudsman would be immediately involved as discussed. Um, so looking at also considering trauma-informed training for those uh, multi-agency you know, staff persons that would be involved. And then, of course, looking at ways to have the discussions around allowing this person to feel safe um, if they need to transfer to another facility uh, during the investigation, and then also working with their family, um, looking at the power of attorney opportunities that weren't quite there, and what that, um, how that will continue to be played out in the decision-making capacity. So. That's where we we got we had another very robust discussion around case study number two, and I will turn it back over to Rajana for this final case study um, in, in today's meeting. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Tanya. The last case study we have is case study three for Ted Cullen. Ted is a 72-year-old man, resides alone in an apartment building in Los Angeles. He recently lost a spouse and has a disability. Ted is sending 10000 dollars a month to a foreign contact. Only $100,000 is left in his bank account, and he's lost $50,000 thus far. Ted's interior apartment is inaccessible because of clutter, and he received a recent eviction notice. Ted has untreated infections on his legs and is struggling to walk. Ted does not have any children, and his closest relative resides in Florida, his sister. Ted is unable to go to his regular doctor visits by himself due to severe and untreated infections on his legs. On our reactor panel, I would like to introduce Akili Saron, if he's on the line, Bertha Hayden, Jim Trajari, and Vivian Mabuko. And the question that I'd like to pose for the reactor panel is, what are the key aspects that you see as being criti critical for addressing Ted's case? You know what I think um, what jumps out to me right away is the fact that we're dealing with an, with isolation, which what we've heard is, you know, um, it has the same negative impact and as being diagnosed with another physical disability. So I think while there's um, many issues, there's, you know, multiple issues here, you know, some to deal with like his self neglect, some to deal with an immediate housing, um, an immediate housing issue that is needed, um, I think, in looking holistically at, at working with Ted, one thing that we will need to make sure to address is how we can combat that isolation and what social services and um, collaboration we could do in order to um, best support Ted. Um, de depending from a legal services perspective, um, in Los Angeles, we, we have a great program called Stay Housed LA, which has now become like a hub um, where if you're dealing with an eviction issue, instead of like running around to see which legal services can help you, you call Stay Housed LA and there and you're assigned to a legal services. So we would look to make sure that connect Ted immediately with that. Um, I also, you know, I think it's important to, um, for lack of a better example, like stop the bleeding around the other social issues that are causing him um, to perhaps be susceptible to financial abuse by this foreign contact. Um, so depending if he was if he was coming to us as an attorney's office and he was telling us everything that's going on, I would probably involve our social worker and talk to perhaps suggesting that he might want to, if he want, talk to about APS and what they do and how they could support him. And also maybe talk about um, encouraging to maybe make a complaint with the FBI that has a special, you know, um, division for victims, uh, elder abuse victims where there's uh, wire transfers involved that we might also want to connect to deal with that aspect. Um, and then, um, 
also just looking to make sure if there's any support groups um, that can help him as he's dealing with his grief um, so that he's better positioned to deal with the legal issues that the tangible legal issues that he has before him. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll jump in and, and really echo Bertha's comment um, about the, the grief and, and understanding the trauma. Like, I think my first reaction, while there are a lot of short term interventions that are going to be needed, is kind of trying to understand why. Um, you know, there seems to be multiple parts of, uh, you know, his well-being and, and taking care of himself that he's not able to do so, do without support. Is that because of grief? Are there impairments that we need to consider and adjust to? Um, and so I really would want to explore with the client, like, kind of what is, what's happening, you know, in terms of his mental health and well-being that is, is you know, getting him to this point. In terms of um, the kind of breadth of breadth of services we're talking about, I really think this is a good case where I would really want to involve the AAA um, in the broad array of services that are offered um, for a client like this. Uh, you know, it's going to take multiple providers being in lockstep. Um, you know, I can probably think of five that there might be. You know, medical transportation, food support, legal services, APS maybe longer term case management, some of that mental health support. And I really think that, um, you know, well-coordinated AAA is going to be kind of one of the better solutions to uh, have that menu in front of whoever's coordinate. You know, I'm guessing in, in this case, it probably could end up on, this looks like a pretty typical APS case where, you know, the worker would have that kind of menu of longer term supports and services available uh, for the client and kind of being able to match and blend all of those services together. Um, totally agree with Berta and, and Jim. Um, I think another thing that would be really important for whatever legal services representation he had is the attorney and the advocates just being really honest about the chances of actually getting any of this money back um, unfortunately, if you are sending money to, you know, an unknown party outside of the US, the chances of you getting the money back are not that great. Um, so like Berta mentioned, really stopping that as, you know, as quickly as possible is really of a great importance because it's very unlikely that we are going to be able to recoup the money and figuring out how to move forward, knowing that he's lost um quite a significant amount of money um that can really influence uh you know his housing situation and how he's going to be able to move forward and care for himself and i would also like to point out you know the eviction um case is there but it's not even clear why there's an eviction notice it might be because of non-payment of rent but it could also be because of the hoarding situation um, and unfortunately, you know, with a hoarding situation, those are really complicated cases. Oftentimes landlords don't want to work with people, even if they can get cleaning in um, and an organizer, they're concerned that the hoarding will continue. You know, this is a mental health issue. Someone needs ongoing, ongoing care. Um, so, you know, the, this is a really multifaceted case, but it's really common. A lot of times people end up at legal services or other aging services, and they've got a myriad of problems that are intersecting. Um, I believe Sarah mentioned in the um, chat, like, you know, how would this person even get to someone who were the first responders? And I haven't seen what the responses are, but I think a lot of people do end up at legal services door because they have an eviction notice. And then that turns into an advocate realizing, oh, there's all these other issues that are going on that we really need help addressing. Um, but I think, you know, like Berta had mentioned, from a trauma-informed standpoint, being very clear clear and um, transparent with the client about like what are the options that they actually have and what are the realistic outcomes for them um, is going to be really important um, so that they don't get their hopes up about oh I'm going to be able to recoup all the money that I sent to whatever country um, or I'm going to be able to fix all my problems I'm going to be able to stay in my unit those things might not be true so you know making sure that clients understand that um, the, the, there may be some change that they have to get used to. Thank you, Vivian. I totally agree. Having that realistic outcome and perspective is really helpful in a, in a case like this, especially with Ted's situation. Um, I also wanted to 
bring up the fact that his closest relative is in Florida and what steps can we take to establish a support network for him locally? Um, how can community organizations assist him to mitigate his isolation and address his social needs? He's, he's not going out. And if he doesn't get legal services, how, what interventions are available for him to get that support? I mean, definitely connecting him with any community-based organizations that um, would be good for him. I don't, you know, we don't know much about his background, but that would be an, a question to ask as he previously, um, you know, participated in church communities or is there a another community group that would be um, good for him to be connected to? Um, are there support groups for people who are isolated um, it, you know, hobbies, things like that, just getting that information, it's not really within, within the wheelhouse of an attorney, but legal services attorneys are incredibly holistic practitioners and are always doing things that are outside of the realm of just straight legal work to try to help their clients as much as possible. Um, I would also like to mention, and you know, Jim can jump in on, on this, this person also might be a candidate for the home safe program um, because they're potentially losing their housing um, because of some pretty severe self-neglect. Um, and uh, with that program, the county could potentially use, county APS could potentially use some of the home safe funds to assist this person in getting their home cleaned up, um, negotiate with the landlord to say, hey, we're gonna get them connected to some mental health services. We're going to help clean up the unit so that they can stay in the unit and kind of make an agreement with them, uh, maybe help pay if there's any back utilities or back rent that's owed, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think as we've seen, um, thank you, Vivian, for mentioning it, HomeSafe is absolutely a potential tool here uh, in terms of bringing together that suite of services in terms of case management, housing support, um, and case management. Uh, with a housing first really perspective. And so, you know, really understanding that the data shows that keeping somebody housed is really the most effective solution and, and then kind of structuring services around that. Um, in terms of the social isolation, depending on where they're at, you know, I, I know of um, certain cities and areas, you know, senior centers can be a really powerful option and, and conduit for folks in terms of uh, having a sense of community, having activities available. Um, you know, as Bertha mentioned, you know, we know what isolation does to older adults and, and really the severity of the impacts it can have on health and well-being. Um, so I think there are, there are a number of options. I mean, I think the good news is, like Vivian said, I think legal services are very, I come from a background of legal services, we are very holistic practitioners. And because we know any one legal intervention, or even if you deal with the leg, but not um, the housing, if you deal with the, the money leaving the bank account, but not, you know, him being isolated, those solutions might be for naught. And so, you know, we have really come to realize in this work that all of these things need to be uh, addressed in tandem and, and with collaborative solutions or else really, you know, you miss one piece of this puzzle and it could mean that the rest of the solutions aren't able to fully support that older adult. No. And I would just add anecdotally, um, from a legal services perspective, we've we've done a lot of outreach to um, places of places of worship or people where people identify with or connect with their faith as being like a strong placehold where maybe somebody might be very, very isolated or not comfortable, but they might still um, attend a group or attend a service. And oftentimes some of the referrals that we see are from those in services and having people, you know, refer somebody like um, similar to, to this case study situation um, to us. So that's a, a, a way to, I, I think it's always, I think when we're looking at the isolation issue, we have to look at the, at the cog of like who's surrounding older adults and what, and make sure that our outreach and our in-services and as we kicked off um, when we were talking about the, um, when somebody was mentioning the inspiring, um, we had events that happened or why it's so critical that we all do, we you know, those we at events it is be so that people who are touching older adults know, know the signs know the trouble signs and know how to quickly, you know, triage or, or connect um, to get someone help like this. Thank you, Bertha. A, a definite coordinated approach would be needed for Ted's case, definitely. And I know that Howard has um, a question as well. Howard? You're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. 
Okay, I do have, <clears throat> I do have some comments to make. First of all, this foreign contact, um, who exactly is this person or agency who is sending money to a, a blog? $10,000, that's an awful lot of money to be spending every month. Um, I might even wonder, is he being blackmailed into doing this? Um, or, or has he been tricked into thinking that he's helping a good call when in reality he might be helping a terrorist organization? I would wonder about that. And then too, the sister in Florida, is she interested and then does, he, does she even know that he's still alive? Um, would she be interested in trying to help out? I would want to know that. Could she help out if she were interested? Um, the most immediate problem is medical is infected ways, and they need to get into a hospital at once for that. He could die if the infection go untreated. And finally, he recently lost his wife, the partner. The man had to be deeply depressed by that. And um, I think there's a very strong probability that he just doesn't care whatever he lives or dies anymore. He just doesn't care, you know? If I get kicked out on the street, if I die from infection, you know, hey, I walk for one person in the world that meant something to me. What reason do I have to live anymore? I might be thinking that in his place. <laughs> so that's what I had to say. Howard, thank you. I love your insightful comments because that's a perspective that we definitely need. Of course, he's going through grief. We don't know if he's estranged with his sister. Um, we don't know who he's sending money to. We don't know if it's a romance scam or he's just being scammed in general or if he's just sending it voluntarily. We, we don't know that. And that's something that intervention interventions are needed to see what's really going on with Ted. So thank you so much insightful comments. Ranjan, I have a question because I can't get my, I, I'm just thinking about this and I think I love all of these perspectives and considerations and the importance of this truly should be a community approach. We can't have the siloed approaches of the medical team is dealing with the medical issue, but I can't get it through my head of, but Ted doesn't want help and he's not seeking help. So who is it? He has to go out at some point. He has to get food somehow. Right. So even thinking about the grocery clerk at the, the store or the bank, the bank that's wiring all this money to a foreign country. I know that there's I, I am not an expert in the the what banks are required to do to screen for um, potential questions on elder abuse. But would the bank be a place that should be flagging? What are these this money going forward? And that it's like we need one bystander who can jump in and say, wait, something doesn't look good. And then it can kind of trigger the whole multidisciplinary approach. So that's what I just am struck by in this situation. Absolutely. And I did message Scott Perello, who is um, the district attorney and deals with financial abuse. Scott, are you on the line still? We'd love to hear your feedback and comments on the mandated reporting for banks due to the large transactions that he's sending abroad. Hi, yes, I'm sorry. So there, in California, there are mandated reporters. They are required, the banks, to file a suspicious activity report. Um, those do go to Adult Protective Services. The, the reality, and I've become an advocate for, for this cause, is that um, we are trying to improve systems, but the, in my opinion, the, the response from law enforcement locally, federally, is still woeful. And uh, sadly, the victims are, are being told there's nothing they can do. And so the question is, what can we do to get the money back? And still here in 2023, sadly, the answer is there's very little we can do once the money is gone. We're working, we're collaborating with the FBI to get better at this. But the best that we can do locally in our communities is to stop the bleeding, to do whatever we can to keep any other penny in that uh, person's bank account from leaving. And that is to do whatever we can to convince them. Oftentimes, the victims will not believe they're being scammed. They get angry when confronted. And so we have to think as a community who should approach them, how to approach them, 
I have family members that call me all the time and I just offer, I said, give me the phone number, I'll try, right? You need to come at any approach. If it's a social worker, a detective, a county prosecutor, anyone can try to break the victim from this trance and then try to secure that money either with a fiduciary or a trusted family member. And I think, you know, just to, to agree, echo with Scott, Sarah and Vivian's point, um, I think the real opportunity we have is the further upstream we move this, the, the, the results and the outcome are just so much better. And so that means if we can get, I think, awareness and community and the quicker this gets to legal services, this gets to a DA, this gets to whoever it needs to get in front of. Um, that really is the most effective situation because, you know, once a lot of this has happened, we've gotten really good at stabilizing the situation at where it's at. But in terms of kind of getting things back and, and reversing some of the damage, that can be a lot more tricky. And so I think one of our most effective strategies is really that awareness campaign and making it so that the average person on the street, the average adult, the grocery store, that that they're aware and thinking about this when they're when they're seeing older adults in their space that that truly I still think is one of the most effective ways we can we can work on this issue. Um, I, I think um, I want to make sure Carol uh, chimes in because I know she knows a lot about this and I put in the chat there's a current bill on the reporting issues, but I'd also like to highlight that. Um, especially with these scams uh, where people are getting a lot of money taken from them. Um, it's important for just the community at large to realize this is not something that is specifically only older adults. The scammers become more and more sophisticated every single day. Everyone is at risk um, to have money stolen from them. It's just more acute with an older, more acute with an older adult because they are more likely to not be working and only be reliant on their retirement and a limited amount of funds. So it's even um, more damaging, but this is a community problem um, where they are targeting anyone who can fall, quote unquote, fall for their tricks and scams, but they are incredibly um, sophisticated. If anyone's seen the recent reporting about the use of AI to be able to literally copy people's voices um, and make it seem like it's a family member talking to you, anyone could fall for something like that. So this is, you know, beyond just older adults or somehow the most vulnerable, everyone is at risk for um, being scammed in this way. But I definitely want to let Carol chime in as well. Thanks, Vivian. Um yeah, one of the one of the issues in California is well everywhere actually it's a it's a two tiered system, and the large multi state banks do have to file suspicious activity reports, but those go to the federal government and there's no mandate in federal law that they report to APS or law enforcement, so that's discretionary. Some banks do, some banks don't, and even the small banks that are regulated by the state aren't consistent at, at filing those reports either. And so that's something that we've really been working on. It's essential that those reports are made quickly so that the social supports and, and, and um, efforts to you know, redirect the, the victim can happen soon enough to protect their finances and their way of life. Um, it, it's a really terrible situation and it's growing. And with AI, it's only getting worse. So thanks, Vivian. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Scott. And I just wanna echo that with the new technology that keeps coming and advancing, we feel so, I don't know, I feel like we're, we're just behind, just a step behind um, when it comes to the scam artist. So it's something that we need to definitely catch up on. Um, Carol, thank you. And Lisa, you had, you had a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to kind of add to this conversation about um, our view of ageism. Um, just a personal thing. Um, my young adult son was having problems with his computer and magically he gets this, uh, you know, chat that says, hey, we can help you with your Microsoft and, you know, just put in your debit card here and for $400, we're going to fix this. And he does. And I'm thinking, kid, you know, what are you doing? And uh, to this day, he swears that they fixed his computer. So if that happened to my mother, what would my reaction be? 
would I feel the need to take over her banking account because she is susceptible to fraud? I didn't feel that with my son. So I think that's just something we have to be thinking about. And that's part of why older adults are like, you know what? I have the right to make a bad decision. And Mm -hmm. yes, it's hard for us to watch it, but I I do. I, this is just not an easy conversation, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And that we're trying to do what's in people's best interests. Um, And I did put a comment in about how, really as advocates, I think our role is about expressed wish advocacy, as opposed to us deciding what is in someone else's best interest. I I don't want you all deciding what's in my best interest um, when you look at my Amazon shopping cart. I I don't want you to uh, determine what my best interest would be in my uh, kitchen in a moment. Yes, you know. Um, So I just, I caution us from trying to create fail safe systems just a perspective and, and i would just like Can to I, clarify because it, it's a it's a point well taken my advocacy and and specifically what i'm talking about are when the the scam is based on a false pretense mm-hmm. it's not a poor decision um it's a complete false pretense that that the victim whatever age they are um, is falling for a, a predator who's out there hunting for a victim. So that's where my advocacy lies. I agree that we should not be raiding people's bank accounts to, to make judgments on what they're spending their money on. But that's the specific type of behavior that, that I was focusing on. That is such an important point. I really appreciate that, Lisa, um, because my assumption was that he was being scammed, but you're absolutely right. It could be that he just wants to be, even if people are like, this woman is bilking you off of hundreds of thousands of dollars, that's his right. But what I do think is even raising questions and having somebody follow up with Ted, if, since he's so isolated and you know alone, it could trigger the doctor to see his legs. It could trigger support in other spaces. And he may determine that, thank you very much. I still wish to send this money to another country. That's none of your business. And then the system would have to um, respect that. So I think that that's a really important point. Um, the final thing I just wanted to say too is that um, you know we're really fortunate. Susan mentioned this in her opening comments that the governor had in, uh, proposed investments in the May Revise focused on advancing older adult behavioral health, and which really I think also focuses on um, isolation and loneliness and. $30 million community capacity grants to build approaches with our local CBO, trusted partners and culturally responsive approaches to addressing older adult behavioral health. And I think a key focus could be um, strategies to address isolation and loneliness and kind of potentially I'm thinking even looking at um, training on these, how you identify these sorts of situations and all that. So this has been super helpful. Uh, just keep an eye out for that because we'll be working on that as soon as the budget's passed and assuming all goes well with that. Thank you, Sarah. And with that, I wanna thank all of the reactor panels, um, panelists for their insightful comments and feedback on, on these, these very complex case studies. Um, that we can definitely, you know, take to our work group and then move forward um, and see how we can build off of um, bridging those gaps that we have identified today. So some of, I'm just going to recap the themes for this one that I heard. I heard, you know, we have isolation. uh, We need multi-coordinated approaches. um, You know, be holistic in addressing and combating isolation, um, looking for support groups, Um, We have, you know, multiple um, agencies that have, um, we have the Home Safe program and the State House program, um, incorporate the AAA for services, services for the client's needs. Um, Just, you know, trauma-informed transparency and realistic outcomes for, for, for TED is what we're looking for. And those were some of the themes that I was seeing. So thank you. And with that, I will go ahead and now turn it over to Lisa Narenberg from the California Elder Justice Coalition to give an update on the 2023 uh, blueprint.
Oops. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Sorry, I was a little unprepared. I thought we had a couple more minutes. <laughs> I guess we're moving quickly through the agenda. So anyway, thank you so much um, to Susan and Eric and to everyone at CDA and to the members of the of uh, the council for all of your leadership so far. And it's really exciting to see how far this council has come and to hear the, the reports already today. I also, uh, in talking about the blueprint, I wanna thank the Archstone Foundation for funding it. Um, I think we have a slide of it. The It's called Reinforcing California's Elder Justice Infrastructure, Committing to Equity and Inclusion. I know that's a, a mouthful and we don't have a, an acronym for it, a quick one. Um, and also we wanna thank the Archstone Foundation for the earlier versions of the blueprint. This is a, a, the third in a series. Uh, we did versions in 2011 and 2016, and all three reflect the wisdom of many, many stakeholders and experts that was collected through summits and interviews, listening sessions, and our brilliant members, several of, several of whom are on this call today. And that's over many years that we've um, been moving issues forward uh, checking off the ones that we've accomplished, but bringing other ones forward. You know, it's especially exciting to be talking to this group because the development of a coordinating council was one of the top priorities in our 2016 blueprint. And it was the master plan on aging that made it a reality. So I want to thank Kim McCoy Wade and all of the people uh, who worked on the master plan. You know, sometimes the elder justice uh, network is seen as separate or apart from aging services. And so including this council as part of the master plan, I think was really important in making that connection. At the kickoff event for the um, Ab Abuse Awareness Month on June 1st, my colleague Carol Sewell gave a terrific overview of what local communities are doing. And what I'd like to focus on today is our recommendations for what we can do at the state level. So to, today you get me. I wanna just start though with a little background on CEJC to set the stage. Uh, we got started about 15 years ago by a group of local service providers who were part of the Archstone Foundation's Elder Abuse Initiative. And we had started meeting informally to talk about barriers that we couldn't resolve at the local level. So we started CGAC to provide a voice to policymakers in Sacramento and in Washington. So what were some of those uh, barriers that we wanted to address? A major one was lack of coordination. You know, here in California, as we all know, we tend to be independent spirits, and that's true of our local service systems. You know, counties want to keep control of their systems so that they can shape them to reflect their local circumstances and their local needs, which has fostered incredible innovation at the local level and things like multidisciplinary teams. But there are drawbacks to that. It's led to just a lot of disparities in how abuse is responded to across the state. And it's also kept us from sharing good ideas and collaborating. Um, without leaders at the, or point people at the state level, we've also missed opportunities to go for federal grants or participate in federal initiatives in the past or having a collective voice. And I think you know we've seen how important it was to have an APS point person in Sacramento uh, recently when the COVID funding came down. And that's really a, a great start. Other barriers that we face though have to do with policy and our, our reporting system, just a little bit of background, it wasn't really designed by our own experts or input from stakeholders. We followed other states in patterning our systems after systems that had been developed to combat child abuse a couple of decades earlier. And they assumed that what worked for abused kids would also work for adults. And that's not to say that the system hasn't helped people, it certainly has, but it's also an imperfect system. And it's required constant revisions that uh, oftentimes create more problems. So for example, as we've heard today, our reporting laws are really complicated. They're among the most complicated laws in the country. 
Um, you know, in meetings with this group and in the meeting today, we've just seen that there are so many entities, uh, over a dozen at least, um, that are involved in our reporting system. And even those who work in the system don't know the ins and outs of it. Our system also for forces service providers to report abuse, even if the victims don't want them to. And a lot of them don't. We hear over and over again, my client just wants her money back, but she doesn't want her son to go to jail. My client doesn't wanna kick her daughter out of her house. She just wants to stop the abuse. So often we do have to weigh public interest uh, against individual rights and it's complicated, but we really need to constantly be looking at that, at that balance. I've also heard a lot of frustration from APS workers who feel that the system doesn't give them the flexibility that they need to address some of the core causes of abuse or to intervene early on when they're more likely to be successful. We also know that the system isn't well understood or very popular with the public. Some consider it ageist, and I, which I think is understandable. And it also leaves a lot of people behind, which is why we're, we've focused so much on equity and inclusion. So the blueprint is divided into uh, eight sections, and I'm just going to highlight uh, some of the recommendations. So for all of the reasons I just mentioned, one of the core uh, recommendations or, or fo focuses of the blueprint is calling for a review of our adult protective services and our, our broader reporting system. And we're not talking about just tinkering on the margins, but really looking at whether what we're doing or what, what we've been doing for almost 40 years is really working. We're calling for things like a no wrong door approach, uh, point of access so that cases get to the right place. I think we have some really unrealistic expectations about every APS worker knowing about the many, many different uh, groups we're hearing about that have a role to play, the FBI, the uh, the consumer protection organizations. Also, we're really pushed for greater equity in access to adult protective services around the state and also within individual communities. And we're also looking at, we recommend looking at the cross-reporting system. You know, one aspect of it is that we require all reports to go to law enforcement, even though we know that it discourages some of the people that we're trying hardest to reach from reporting whether or not that's necessary or not to have all those cases cross-reported. We're also calling for a public health approach to abuse that can help us having to take drastic measures like incarceration or conservatorship and instead focus whenever possible on prevention. So that includes things like raising awareness about the risk factors that predict abuse so that we can try to reduce those factors. Um, our researchers in elder abuse have been telling us for many years that one of the strongest predictors of abuse is social isolation. And a new study that came out recently suggests that how important having a sense of community is in reducing risk. And that to me suggests how important it is that the long-term services and support and the protective service networks work together. Prevention also includes things like encouraging people to have advanced directives, which we talked about earlier today, and estate plans. You know, not having plans not only raises the risk of abuse and financial insecurity for individuals, but also it interferes with the accumulation of wealth uh, within communities and over generations. We devote a lot of attention in the blueprint and in our Person in our internal discussions to the issue of conservatorship. You know, we've all heard the complaints and the calls to free Brittany, uh, but part of make, what makes this such a daunting task is that we don't have even very basic information about how many people are under, are under conservatorship, let alone what's working and what isn't. So we really need research um, and that's why we're really looking forward to seeing the results of the Judicial Council's study. There are also a lot of misperceptions about conservatorship that we need to correct so that we can have constructive conversations about it. We call for, public guard for funding for public guardians and providing support to those programs. And we also recommend that California start a WINGS which stands for Working Interdisciplinary Networks of Guardianship Stakeholders. 
And WINGS are a national model that were developed to help, help states really do a deep dive into their guardianship programs in conjunction, in collaboration with the courts. And we're really pleased that this council has a subcommittee on conservatorship, which we're gonna be hearing about later. Um, and perhaps that could even be a, a first step towards having a WINGS here in California. We also have a section on caregiving that acknowledges the critical role that caregivers play in protecting elders and preventing abuse. Uh, one of the things that we emphasize is the need to expand our definition of caregivers to include extended and non-traditional families and to recognize cultural variations. We also need uh, to find more ways to support families uh, through things like mediation and restorative justice to help them when conflicts arise so that they don't escalate and become um, and require more uh, intrusive interventions. Legal assistance, particularly for non-affluent elders is another top priority. And you've heard about some of the problems earlier today. We know that most, service, most communities don't have an, nearly enough uh, legal aid, which is a gap that they often can't fill on their own. It requires state and federal action. One example um, is removing funding restrictions. We know that, for example, the Older Americans Act, legal funds can only be used for tenants in tenant landlord disputes, even though we know that a lot of older tenants are also being abused. Many victims across the state also need help with things like recovering losses and restitution, help with advanced directives and estate plans. And to really, we believe that to really have an impact, we have to enlist the private bar to take cases that legal services just can't. Things like class actions or complicated uh, financial abuse cases that require upfront funds. But private attorneys also need to have the right kind of training, which is something we need to, that we talk about in the blueprint. And they also need to be held accountable. We also, I, we talk about in the blueprint, the need to look be, to, uh, beyond some of the traditional remedies and to new approaches, things like restorative justice, which I know I talk about a lot, that don't just force people into adversarial positions when they don't want to be there. Nursing homes is another area that we've uh, talked about. We've, in the blueprint, we call for a state task force on nursing home reform. You know, the, the pandemic has really exposed some shocking deficiencies in homes, in staffing, in infection control, quality care that started way before COVID. But um, I think it's that what we've learned through COVID makes it really imperative that we uh, that we really look at the system. And that's gonna require collaboration between CDA, public health, the AG's office. And we hope that that's an area that this council can really help with. Equity and inclusion is another priority. I think we address equity and inclusion throughout the blueprint, which aligns with the, e the equity tools and principles that were outlined in the, in the master plan on aging. And I also want to uh, mention that the, that this council has developed its own tools and principles for equity under the Vivian's leadership. But we did feel the need to include a, a special section that focuses on underserved groups. And groups that we've identified as underserved include uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color or BIPOC, impoverished elders and those who live in underserved communities, particularly rural communities, LGBTQ adults, adults with cognitive impairments and communication barriers, and people who are experiencing homelessness and incarceration. We also have a, a, a section on what needs to be done at the national level, because a lot of the barriers that we face here in California require federal action. And when we have opportunities, those are things we really need to take advantage of. For example, just recently, the Administration for Community Living announced that they're accepting input into the Older Americans Act, which could potentially address some of the issues that we've talked about in these meetings, like the, the type of legal services that they can fund. The Office for Victims of Crime is also, uh, has also just issued revised regulations for victim comp and accepting recommendations for that. 
I know that's something that we talk a lot about is the need to revamp or to extend victim compensation, particularly for victims of financial abuse. So opportunities like these actually come up, come up a lot, usually without a lot of warning and quick turnarounds. And so the blueprint includes our uh, federal wish list so that we're prepared when we have those kinds of opportunities. So I wanna wrap up by stressing how really important I think it is for this council to be involved in implementing the blueprint and in particular in, in promoting interdepartmental collaboration. We certainly have already done a lot, uh, and, but we hope that, the, that this council will continue to provide a forum for state agencies to talk to each other, to update the advocacy community and the stakeholders on what they're doing, their plans, their opportunities. A lot of what's happening at the state level doesn't filter down to the local level and vice versa. So I still think we have some work to do in that area. We'd also like to see the council become a trusted source of informa information for legislators and advocates as they consider new policies and programs so that we can uh, weigh in on bills in the making instead of waiting until after the fact when it's harder to, to make changes. We also hope that the group would receive status reports on elder justice initiatives around the state and provide updates to the California legislature. We'd also like to see this group set priorities for elder justice um, and to gain generate support for them. You know, one way of doing that might be uh, for having this group come up with a theme for uh, uh, Awareness Month that comes next year or in the future. So beyond the council, we hope that other organizations are also join us. We're not possessive about this. It's the blueprint is out there for everyone. And we hope that groups will use it to generate discussion, to uh, help them with their planning, to support funding and policy proposals. And we also hope that researchers will use it. I think we've uh, identified a lot of areas today and, and certainly in other areas, the importance of researchers, um, research that can guide policy and educators. Uh, we hope educators will use it as a source for coursework or for developing uh, curricula. So it's there for the taking. Uh, we ask that you, we just ask that you let us know if you are implementing parts of the blueprint so that we can all work together to uh, generate some momentum. So thank you again for this opportunity to tell you about the blueprint. And if you have any questions or would like help with it, uh, feel free to uh, contact us at uh, using our website at elderjusticecal.org. So thanks. Ranjana? Lisa, thank you so much. I, I can't, I can't tell you that how like the blueprint is amazing. I've already started reading and going through it, and I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge you and your team on all of your wonder, wonderful work and focus on protecting the rights of older adults and adults with disabilities and highlighting those gaps and sharing this knowledge of you know this information in depth with all of us um, on how we can bridge the gaps that are out there. So I really do um, thank you. And thank you for providing this overview. Next, um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we will be providing our elder, uh, elder Disability Justice Coordinating Council workgroup updates. And we have Jim Trajari from, um, who is our APS administrator from the California Department of Social Services. Um, and he is the Adult Protective Services Chair. Jim, would you like to provide the first updates? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ranjana. Um, you know, so the work group uh, remains focused, I think, on really setting, setting the course for the next period of time in terms of what our priorities are going to be, uh, in terms of, you know, where the focus is going to be and our time is going to be best spent. I think there are a couple of really, um, you know, important uh, opportunities coming for adult protective services. And there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration, as I think you've <laughs> probably heard is my theme for the day, but um, working with, you know, several groups from CDA, um, you know, connecting with various other state agencies to make sure that, um, you know, we are coordinating these services 
resources in a way that makes sense and are person focused and really um, using it as an opportunity to make sure that the client is supported in every single way that they need. Um, you know, we are coming off of our We Add event uh, on June 1st. And so now I'm really kind of diving back into this work formally now that the event is over for our, our event. I know um, other events took place too. And I'm excited to really, you know, I, I lead the APS work group, but I'm, I'm participating in all three work groups and really seeing organically how the three are already overlapping in terms of issues that we're focusing on in terms of kind of where the conversations are going, make me really hopeful that we're gonna also have some kind of cross uh, work group uh, initiatives going that that each of us can, can take a piece of. So still in the kind of phase, I think of, of getting where our, our group is going to head, but there's been a lot of robust conversation um, regarding various topics we're, we're looking to address. And if anyone who participates in the group, uh, has anything that I've, I've missed, um, please jump in, but uh, the work continues. Thank you, Jim. Does anyone have any, any members have any questions or comments um, for Jim, for the APS work group? Um, I just have a quick comment, which is what I appreciate about each of these work groups is that there's so much intersectionality across each of them and that these full committee meetings allow opportunities to kind of cross pollinate the different issues that are elevated in the work groups. But we would definitely welcome any feedback from you all about, um, you know, any reflections you have about um, the work and the ways we focus the discussion in both the work groups and the full committee meetings. So just wanna thank you, Jim, for your tremendous work and commitment to this um, committee and uh, to the subcommittee as well. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jim. If there are no questions, let me see. Carol, do you see any questions? I do not. Okay. With that, we'll go to Vivian Mabaku. She is the Equity Director at Justice and Aging Legal Services Chair. Vivian? Thanks, Ranjana. Um, okay, so we had our first meeting, and what we're really focusing on as a subcommittee is really deepening our understanding of legal services and funding sources and limitations for legal services um, right now. And then also, like Jim mentioned, identifying those overlapping issues that all three work groups can work on. Um, so at our first meeting, we were able to have a representative from the California Bar Association present on the various funding sources that are available through IOLTA, which is interest on lawyer trust accounts, um, and provided information about the literally hundreds of millions of dollars that are available for legal services, um, organizations who are serving um, you know, anyone in California, but also they express their interest in having more organizations that sp serve specifically older adults um, to apply for that IOLTA funding. So we're gonna continue that conversation about how do we promote the um, availability of those funds um, and get more organizations to access those funds. Um, we've also reached out to a representative from the Legal Aid Association of California, LAC, to discuss you know, issues facing legal services organizations throughout the state. Um, and right now, one of our projects is that the committee will be looking at ways to improve the CDA legal services providers website. So right now there is a website there on the CDA website that has information about all of the legal services providers throughout the state that serve older adults, but we want to look to streamline that information, make it more easily usable, easily usable for non legal advocates and make that really kind of a one stop shop for um, any kind of advocate who is looking for, oh, my client has a legal issue or potentially has a legal issue. How do I connect them to legal services in my area. Um, we will also be following up on the equity principles that we created last year. Um, Lisa mentioned them and Ranjana read out um, the principles at the beginning of the meeting, um, but we are going to look into um, the ways that we can kind of solidify those as a part of the entire council and how we integrate that into the work of the council. Thank you, Vivian. Does anyone have any questions for the legal services work group? 
I have a question about the equity principles, which I loved, and thank you for that very much. Do you think that, that same, those same principles could be applied to, or would they need to be tweaked for all of our other MPA committees, stakeholder committees? So the overall principles that were on John and Red at the beginning were created as just principles for the entire council. But then we also have an equity tool that we created for the work of the council. And I think that is already at a point that any of the subcommittees could use it. And the tool is really just questions to ask when we are approaching an issue to make sure that we're considering all of the, um, you know, all of the groups that could be impacted and make sure that we're approaching the work in an equitable way. Right. Well, I love the idea of thinking about in our other committee work, how we might develop equity principles and weave in the equity tool as well. So thank you for that. Well, I would be willing and very excited to work with anyone if we wanted to do that specifically on the APS side or the conservatorship as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Bertha Hayden, directing attorney from Bet Zedek, as and she is the conservative uh, conservatorship chair. Bertha, hi. Um, good afternoon, all. At the Conservatorship Working Group, uh, we've spent a couple of meetings really delving into the landscape of conservatorship. We, we can go on to the next slide. Um, and looking to see in terms of what are the areas that we want to focus on in terms of ad addressing um, conservatorship and the institutions that support, that support um, people that might need conservatorship or to prevent um, the need for conservatorship. So to that end, the working group has decided to focus on five key areas, education on conservatorship and decision-making tools, data collection on probate conservatorships, streamlining APS referrals to the public guardian, advanced health care directives, and supported decision-making. We, the committee feels that these five areas are um, of what's most important in order to strategize, um, get clearer information and research in areas of conservatorship and also one key thing that I think has um, come up across in the case studies is demystifying um, legal processes or legal tools for the community to increase accessibility um, when there is a social need. So we look forward to um, digging in deeper and, and collaborating with the other working groups as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bertha. And I just wanna add to our chairs, thank you so much for your continued leadership and for stepping up and uh, representing the work groups as a chair. We really do appreciate it. So thank you. I'm echoing Sarah Steenhausen's um, sentiment. So thank you so much, Jim, Vivian, and Bertha. And now I will transition it over to Carol. Hi, thank you, Rajana. Um, now we're going to turn to our public comment period. Um, you are welcome to make a public comment. Um, I want to remind folks that uh, two minutes is allocated for each public comment. Attendees joining in this webinar Zoom function can use the Q&A function to ask a question or select the raised hand icon. And uh, we'll go ahead and announce your name and unmute your line. You can make your comment. Attendees joining by phone uh, can press star nine on the dial pad to raise your hand, and we will announce the last four digits of your phone number and unmute your, your line. So if you would like to make a public comment at this point in time, please raise your hand. Okay, we have Jesse Archer. Jesse Archer, go ahead. You can unmute your line. Go ahead. Am I unmuted? Yes, you can Hi. go ahead, please. Hi, thank you so much for this. This has been very, very um, important and um, enlightening for me. I'm a field ombudsman. And I just had a question when you were talking, um, Elisa, about the, the blueprint and, and sharing between agencies. And I guess this is for Blanca as well, but how much of the statewide ombudsman case data is being mined that could really um, be used to highlight and target policy proposals and also uh, as a way um, to back up funding. 
Thank you, Jesse, for that question. Um, first of all, yes, we are working. Uh, we actually have um, now a um, health policy um, analyst who's part of our team. Um, the data that we have is rich and we just need to be able to mine that data so that we're providing um, the best information of, to legislators, um, to um, you know, anyone who will listen to ensure that we have um, the kind of information that will inform policy and also inform any further uh, requests that we want to make for increasing funding for the program. Um, we're happy to share the information and we have been sharing it with our uh, with anybody who will accept the presentation. Uh, we have five year trends. So um, that is precisely what we're trying to do. And now we're, we're trying to look more deeply into not only um, the types of um, complaints that we receive, but how long does it take for a case to be closed? What's the average time? And then really looking deeply into uh, when we say physical abuse, gross neglect, uh, you know, the top five categories, um, what exactly, uh, where are they? Uh, are, are there hot spots in the state? Right. So, that's, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Yeah, it's absolutely. just a gold mine there. So yes. uh, I'm sure there's a lot of, of work um, from your office or whoever's doing that mining to, to figure it out. But um, yeah, not just the abuses, I guess, but the punishments or when they're substantiated, what happens if it acts as a deterrent and maybe push for harsher, you know, penalties for for bad actors as well. Absolutely. Thank you for your question, Jesse, and for thank, your work. Thank you, Blanca. Thank you, Jesse. Anyone else um, have a public comment to make? Feel free to raise your hand. that uh, we can move forward in the agenda. We can close public comment period. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to turn it over to the director of the California Department of Aging, uh, Susan DeMorris. Thank you, Carol and everyone. I am just, um... I'm just in awe of this council and the expertise, the passion, the perspectives. I love the format that was designed today um, where we got to really have an exchange and bring in different perspectives. Um, I wanna especially thank all of our state partners who joined us today. Um, you know, one of our, our charges here is how we can better coordinate and it, it starts by representation and participation. So thank you to everyone who joined today um, to be part of the conversation. Um, I learned a lot and I, I, I'm i trying to think we're about, I think this might be the fourth meeting, but we've made so much progress in terms of organizing ourselves and the content. Um, I really feel the momentum going forward. Um, so thank you for organizing such an excellent agenda. I wanna make sure that Eric has an opportunity um, to share with the group. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, I just wanna echo all of the appreciation shown to everyone who helped put together this meeting and also the, the meeting of the work groups in the interim. It's just a tremendous effort. And we really see uh, that through the rich information that was shared today. So keep up the great work. Uh, I know we have a lot more to do, but I am so happy with um, where we're at today. So thank you everyone who's been involved. It's such a great effort. So I think with that, we, we call the meeting to um, an end. Um, the recording will be shared. We meet again October 17th from one to four. I wanna thank again the CDA staff for staffing today's meeting and organizing the agenda and the materials and the slide deck. 
and um, the commitment of everyone who presented as a panel reactor and to the public and participants who put comments and questions in the chat. Thank you for stimulating the meeting and the dialogue and making for a very engaged discussion. We'll see you all again in October. Thank you so much. Thanks.